Hi everybody and welcome back to room nine, our region's largest classroom. My name is Miss St. Louis and I'm a teacher at Rogers Elementary School in the Melville School District. And we are located in South St. Louis County. Today, I'm here to teach a reading lesson that's geared towards students who are in the third grade. But all learners are more than welcome to explore and join along with us. So let's get started. Today, we are going to be continuing our exploration of nonfiction text structures. Now, text structures are the way in which an author chooses to organize information, okay? And so authors can choose to use one, two, or even multiple different text structures, okay? So, so far this week, we've talked about three different text structures. We've talked about descriptions, which is when an author gives characteristics or details about a person, place, or thing. We've talked about cause and effect which is when the author describes an effect, uh, describes an event and why it happens. And we've also compared and contrast, which is when the author explains how two or more things are alike or different, which is something that we're seeing in this series that we talk about all week. And this week we are exploring nonfiction text structures through the Who Would Win series by Jerry Pelota. Okay, so, Today is Thursday and it's my last day with you this week, which means we have one more nonfiction text structure to go over. So today we're going to be going over sequencing and I'll write it up here for you. So sequencing is when we put a group of events in order, right? So we're gonna put them in a sequence, okay? So we can use graphic organizers to help us, right? Telling us when we do first, then, next, then, and last, you know, first, second, third, fourth. So we can use flowchart maps to help us. Today, we're going to be creating our own flowchart, flow chart, just to show you how easy it is to do at home with just a blank paper and something to write with. So, I want you to think, because something kind of special is coming up this weekend. Do you know what it is? That's right, it's Halloween. So, let's create a little flow chart map to explain what we might do on Halloween night. So, what is going to happen first? What would you do first on a Halloween night? Yeah, you might put on your costume. Very good. So then what would you do next? Yeah, you might take a picture, right? I know everyone loves getting pictures on Halloween. Then what would you do? Yeah, you might walk to your first house. House number one, right? And then you can Number four, tell a joke. Because everyone's got to tell a joke on Halloween, right? Then you, with number five, get some candy or a treat or maybe a trick. And last but not least, whew, I'm running out of space for you to see you would move on, right? You get to go to the next house. So this flow chart could go on forever and ever, depending on how many houses you go to. You go to house number two, okay? So some flow charts could go on and have millions of steps, and some could only have three or four. 
So flow charts like this are very helpful for letting us know what to do in order, right? So think about instructions, right? Instructions are sequenced, put in a certain order so that you're able to build something correctly. If they didn't put those instructions in there, then you might not end up with the bookshelf that you bought, okay? So sequencing is very important so that we know what happens first, next, and last. It helps to keep our thought processes in order. So today we are going to be exploring another book. And at the end, we're going to do a little bit of sequencing on our own. Ooh, not the best eraser today, huh? All right, so are you ready to see which two animals we're going to pit together against each other in this long awaited challenge? Drum roll, please. Today, we are challenging the Triceratops versus the Spinosaurus. This is a prehistoric battle. All right, who would win? Millions and millions of years ago, dinosaurs walked on Earth. What would have happened if a Triceratops met a Spinosaurus? Would they have had a fight? If they had, who do you think would have won? Meet Triceratops. This dinosaur's name means three horned face. It was a herbivore that walked on four legs. Its mouth was shaped like a beak. Definition, an herbivore is an animal that eats only plants. Fact, today's alligators and crocodiles have legs that come out of the sides of their bodies. Did you know all dinosaurs had legs directly under their bodies? Triceratops did not have an exceptionally long tail. It looked evenly balanced on all four legs. Meet Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus means spine lizard. It had a long backbone made up of many vertebrae or bony parts. The tall spines on its back formed a sail. Spinosaurus was a carnivore. So a carnivore is an animal that eats meat. Size fact, Spinosaurus was the largest meat-eating dinosaur. Sorry, T-Rex, you were smaller. What? Something was bigger than the T-Rex? Spinosaurus lived in swamps and was, properly, and was probably a great swimmer. Its mouth was perfectly shaped for catching fish. Paleontology. Paleontology is the study of the past by digging and learning about fossils. How do we know dinosaurs lived on Earth? While digging, people have discovered fossilized bones that are larger and different from those of animals currently living on Earth. This is a dinosaur fossil that was discovered by paleontologists during a dinosaur dig. Sometimes only fragments are found and it's difficult to identify the dinosaur. Fact, a fossil is bone, teeth, or other matter preserved by rocks and minerals for thousands or millions of years. Definition, a paleontologist is a scientist who studies the past through fossils and rock formations. Archaeology. Archaeologists dig, dig, and dig to find ancient buried buildings and cities. Sometimes while excavating a site, archaeologists discover fossilized bones of extinct creatures. Where would you rather work? On a dinosaur dig or an ancient city dig? If you discovered a new dinosaur, what would you call it? Definition, archaeology scientifically studies ancient peoples and cultures by excavating sites. That's a good question. Which would you rather be, a paleontologist or an archaeologist? Hmm, that's pretty tough. I don't know. I think I might have liked to have been an archaeologist. If you're looking for a last minute Halloween costume, maybe you could go as one of those. Hmm, Indiana Jones was an archaeologist. Electronic tools. 
Modern tools such as satellites and sonar are used to hunt and find dinosaur fossils. Satellites, a satellite beaming a signal to the earth. And sonar, a scientist with equipment beaming sound waves at a fossil underground. Electronic puzzle, pu Ooh, let's start that over. Electronic pulses and sound waves find unusual sites to start digging. Fact, satellites and sonar are also used to find oil and natural gas. Standard tools. There is no easy way to do a tough job. Eventually, paleontologists and archaeologists have to get their hands and clothes dirty. They dig with picks, trowels, and shovels. Small details are important. Big tools are eventually put aside and brushes, magnifying glasses, and tiny tools are carefully used to preserve important information. That's a lot of tools that they use. Big. How big was the Whew, These words are hard today. I'm struggling with some fluency. Let's go back and try that again. How big was Triceratops? Big, bigger than most elephants. Triceratops was roughly 30 feet long and 10 feet high and weighed up to 12 tons. Try that. Triceratops was, a, was bigger than an African elephant, the heaviest land animal on earth today. Weight conversion, 12 tons is equal to 24,000 pounds. So here's an elephant and here's a teacher. Did you know the first dinosaur ever was named the Megalosaurus? Huge. How huge was Spinosaurus? Huge. It was taller than a giraffe and longer than a humpback whale. It was about 60 feet long and weighed up to nine tons. Did you know the second dinosaur to be named was the Iguanodon? Whew. Fun fact, not all dinosaurs were huge. Some grown-up dinosaurs were such, ugh. some grown-up dinosaurs such as a Composegna were smaller than kindergartners. Dinosaur. In the late 1800s, two of the most famous dinosaur hunters were busy looking for fossils. They were friends at first and then bitter rivals. Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. Fact, Marsh and Cope never found any dinosaur eggs. Did you know they never found any baby dinosaurs either? Who would win? Marsh versus Cope. They discovered well over a hundred new species of dinosaurs. Books and movies have been written about these scientists. Hunters. Marsh worked to find fossils for the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale University. Cope hunted fossils for the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Here are some of the species they found. The Allosaurus. The Allosaurus means different lizard. Brontosaurus. Brontosaurus means thunder lizard. Stegosaurus. And Stegosaurus means covered lizard. Most of the fossilized bones they discovered were in the American West, including Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. Not too far from us, right? To find some dinosaurs. The Triceratops skeleton. This is a Triceratops skeleton. It was discovered in North America. Did you know Triceratops top and bottom teeth cut like scissors? which allowed it to eat tough plants. Take a close look at the skeleton. Think of your own skeleton. What do you have in common with Triceratops? Its width, hands, tails, or beak? No. Four limbs, vertebrae, and ribs? Yes. Can you think of more? Spinosaurus skeleton. This is a Spinosaurus skeleton. It was discovered in Morocco on the continent of Africa. Notice how skinny the Spinosaurus is. It is shaped like a fish. Take a close look. What do you have in common with a skeleton? Its sail, three fingers, or long skinny jaw? No. Its two legs and ribs? Yes. Toenails? Maybe. What else? Think. 
Cerato mm, ceratopsians. Ceratopsia means horned face. Triceratops is a member of a group of dinosaurs called the Ceratopsians. Fact. Torosaurus had one of the largest skulls of any land animal that ever lived on Earth. The theropods. Spinosaurs are in a group called theropods. Other theropods include the Gigantosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex, and Velociraptor. What color? Nobody today really knows the color of dinosaurs were all those millions of years ago. What color do you think the Triceratops was? In the animal kingdom, males are often a different color than females. What design? And there's little proof of what skin patterns the dinosaurs may have had. Think of the diversity of species and colors of animals living today. The color of Spinosaurus could have been any pattern or multiple designs. That's crazy to think about. Where oh where, in 1923, in Mongolia, a clutch of fossilized dinosaur eggs were discovered, but no infants or toddlers were ever found. It puzzled the scientific community. Where were the babies? Where were the juveniles? It was a mystery. Meet Jack Horner. When Jack Horner was six years old, he found his first dinosaur bone. As an adult, Jack served as a consultant on the Jurassic Park movies. He may be the greatest dinosaur hunter who ever lived. Where are the babies? In 1978, Jack Horner theorized that if adult dinosaurs and predators lived along the ocean coastline, the mothers and babies must have been in the foothills. Jack dug in the foothills of Montana. This used to be the seacoast 150 million years ago. It took a while, but he was right. The baby jawbone he examined led the way to finding a Marasaura nursery. The fossils proved that the Marasaura took care of its young. Speed. Triceratops looked slow, but it might have been a fast runner. A rhinoceros can run up to 30 miles per hour. Maybe a triceratops could do half that speed. Footprints. How do we know about dinosaur footprints? Dinosaurs walked in mud or clay, and then the mud dried, and after many years became rock. Their footprints were preserved. Quickness. The fastest living animal on two legs is an ostrich, which can run 45 miles per hour. Spinosaurus probably ran 15 to 20 miles per hour. Footprints. What did we learn when the dinosaur footprints were discovered? There was no line between their feet. This meant they did not drag their tails along the ground. Defensive armor. Triceratops could be best described as a horned plant eater. Shield. Its head has a protective shield. Horns and four legs. The offensive weapons. Spinosaurus has great weapons. A bite with long jaw and sharp pointy teeth. It can shred with its fingers and claws and it can smack with its tail. Triceratops is busy eating green leaves. Spinosaurus is roaming around to look for food. The two dinosaurs see each other. Triceratops walks away. Hungry Spinosaurus jogs over to attack. Triceratops runs away. This plant eater does not want to fight. Spinosaurus easily catches up and bites Triceratops. Triceratops turns and faces Spinosaurus. These two dinosaurs push each other back and forth. Triceratops charges Spinosaurus. They fight ferociously. It's agility versus bony headed frills, teeth and claws versus horns. Nearby a volcano erupts. Oh no, it's smoky and that's, it's so smoky that no one can see what's happening. Ash is falling. Ash and lava bury the two dinosaurs. But what happened? It's 100 million years later. We are on a dinosaur dig. The paleontologists have unearthed dinosaur fossils. Who won the fight? Turn the page for the answer. We don't know. This one's really hard because we don't know the animals, right? So this one, you have to make your own predictive guess, right? Make a prediction. Who do you think would have won? Hmm, the Triceratops or the Spinosaurus? That's a tough one. 
All right, so today we talked about sequencing, putting events in order. So we're going to sequence the first part of this fight. Okay, so what happens first, right? isn't working. Let's try another one. Okay. So what happens first? The Spinosaurus is hungry. Okay. So what does he do? He goes after the triceratops. And bites, right? Then what happens? What does a triceratops do? He charges the Spinosaurus. The Triceratops charges the Spinosaurus. Okay. Then what happens? A volcano erupts. And what happens next? They get buried by lava and ash. So what we were able to do, oops, you couldn't see that, I'm so sorry. What we were able to do is take the events, right, of the fight that happened in this book, and we were able to sequence them, put them in order, okay? So sequencing is really, really great when we want to tell the order of events, right? This can be very helpful when we're talking about events in history right? Like wars or the civil rights movement or um, talking about um, things that have happened over time, right? They're very helpful to make sure that we talk about what happens first, next, and last, right? Keeping things in order because that helps our readers to know what's going on. We don't want to confuse people by talking about something that happened last, but talk about it first, so sequencing is really important to keeping our timeline straight, okay? So this was our last text structure that we were talking about this week. It's all about, and so remember, text structures are all about the way an author chooses to organize information. So as you are reading different books, I challenge you to try and see if you can find different structure, text structures within the text because authors are always using different types. Now this week, we were only able to talk about four different text structures, but there are plenty more out there. So if you're interested, it might be a great opportunity for you to take a chance to go out there and research and learn some more. And I hope that this week you were able to learn a ton about text structures. So remember, we talked about descriptions, okay? Which is when you, an author gives characteristics or details about something. We talked about cause and effect. The author, when the author describes an event and how it happens, and uh, an event and why it happens. Oh, I am struggling with my words today. We compared and contrasted, which is when authors explain how two or more things are alike or different. 
And we talked about sequencing, which is when the author outlines events in a chronological order or gives step-by-step -step instructions. And this week, we couldn't have done it all without the amazing Who Would Win books. These books are so much fun to read and we only got to explore four different ones. There are plenty more out there. I mean, look at how many different books there are on the back here. So I would challenge you to go off to your local library and see if maybe they have some different copies of these if you are really interested in them because they're amazing books and it might be something that you wanna try and read on your own. Now, boys and girls, Today is Thursday, which means I won't see you again until Monday. It is also the last day that I will see you before Halloween. So if you are going out trick-or-treating with your friends and family, I hope that you have a fun, safe night. I hope that you are able to get out there and show off your costume if you are wearing a costume or just a fancy outfit. Um, and I challenge you to make sure that as you are out that you are staying safe and healthy and doing everything you can to make sure that you are um, taking care of yourself and the people around you, all right? Halloween is a super fun time, but it's also time that we need to make sure that we are being as safe as possible. So make sure that you look across this both ways before you cross the street. Make sure that you are not out there walking alone, that you always have an adult with you. And make sure that you are being safe by walking on sidewalks, so that way that those people who are out driving at night can make sure to stay safe as well. Because we want everyone to come home safely so that you can enjoy your candy and continue on. And we'll see you again back here next time that you join us here in room nine. Bye everybody. Have a happy Halloween. Teaching in Room 9 is made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.